Welcome to the 19th Century Charitable Association, where our mission is giving and sharing our historic building. We're very happy to have a good audience today for our program, which is about a woman I had never heard of before uh, discovering this program. And so I'm very excited to bring it to us today. Uh, we have two presenters. We have an author and we have a historic interpreter who's going to be here as the character of the biography that we're going to be hearing about. So our author today is Andrea Frederici Ross, who said that after graduating from Northwestern, before she had children, before she had puppies, before life, she wrote a book for the Chicago Zoological Society called Let the Lions Roar, The Evolution of Brookfield Zoo. And it was a lot of research there was with oral histories, old newspapers, zoo archives, searching for pictures and papers. And she's now working on an updated version of this. She first learned about Edith Rockefeller McCormick when she was writing that first book. She found her to be highly unusual, and I think that's probably an understatement. After years of researching, she found her character not only unusual, but enigmatic, infuriating, and inspiring. She was a brilliant woman, undaunted, yet ultimately sidelined by the powerful men in, around her. The book that uh, the, the biography that she presented is called Edith the Rogue Rockefeller McCormick. And this book was awarded the Book of the Year in Traditional Nonfiction by the Chicago Writers Association. So Edith Rockefeller McCormick was the daughter of John D. Rockefeller, and she married the son of Cyrus McCormick. And that's how she came to Chicago. So here today, as well as our author, is Elizabeth Carlson, also known as Ellie. She's a historian and a performer. For over 30 years, she has worked as a curator in small to mid-sized museums. She has a BA with honors from Roosevelt University and a master's of historical administration and museum studies from the University of Kansas. She completed a professional internship at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in the Division of Costumes. She's received a multiplicity of museum and history awards. So Ellie comes as a character, in character. In fact, she's got many characters. 13 women live inside her. And some of the people here in the audience today saw her yesterday coming as a former 19th century member, Mayma Cheney Borthwick. She can make a 1950s themed cocktail party really be a 1950s cocktail gathering, complete with the tastes and scents. She believes that properly costumed living history is the closest we can come to time travel, so far. So today she's here to bring to life the complex and fascinating former Chicagoan and citizen of the world, Edith Rockefeller McCormick. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Deb, for the, the invitation and for getting us all set up here. Uh, I appreciate that you all came out on this very cold day when it would have been much easier to stay home. So thank you very much. Um, I first became aware of Edith many years ago when I wrote Brookfield Zoo's history book, Let the Lions Roar. I knew that she was a colorful character. I had heard stories about how she believed she was the reincarnation of King Tut's child bride, <laughs> about the disastrous breakup of her marriage and her spectacular fall from grace. I had also heard a lot of misinformation. I just didn't know that yet. There are many books 
about Edith's father, John D. Rockefeller, the oil tycoon, and her brother, the great philanthropist. I could just imagine what it would be like to grow up as the daughter of the nation's richest man. Oh, it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> Quite the opposite, I'm afraid. I grew up wearing hand-me-downs. Bessie, Alta, Junior, and I grew up first in Cleveland and then later in New York City. But our lives were full of prayer and duty. Mother's favorite maxim, is it right, is it duty? I grew up earning pennies catching flies, <laughs> weeding the garden, practicing music. But let me be clear, those pennies were meant for the collection plate, not for spending. Every hour of our lives was rigidly consumed with organized behavior. We had no idea we were rich. Not, not a clue. Gradually, as we became older, and we began to understand more of our circumstances, we realized that the public hated Bob. <laughs> there, there were front page cartoons lampooning him. Death threats, even. We had no idea of But those fears, those fears crept in, and they never left us, ever. It became clear to me that while the family was close-knit and the three daughters clearly loved, it was Edith's brother, Junior, who got the best of everything the only son, the heir apparent. When Junior was a teenager, father created a private school for him and other like-minded young men that meant rich, religious, proper. Two of the boys who joined Junior in these studies were Harold and Stanley McCormick, sons of Cyrus McCormick, the Reaper King. And young Harold, blue-eyed, fun-loving, whistling, captured Edith's fancy and slowly became part of the family. He proposed in 1895, and they set a date in late November. Our wedding did not go as planned. <laughs> not even remotely. I was determined that it would be the finest, most elegant wedding that New York City had ever seen. Father was adamant that the marriage ceremony would take place at our Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. Hardly the finest of venues. But I may do taking out the first several rows of pews, bringing in cartloads of orchids and foliage. And then, the day before the wedding, Harold came down with a case of pleurisy. The doctors warned that it would turn into a pneumonia if he ventured out. So, I adapt. <laughs> we moved the entire ceremony to Harold's suite at the Buckingham Hotel. No orchids. 
just the family in the suite, Harold leaning heavily on his brother Stanley's arm. The day of the wedding dawned dark and stormy. It was planned for noon, but by then the skies were as dark as midnight. Rain fell in torrents. The streets turned to rivers. It was under those circumstances that we took our vows. <laughs> Mother Nature screaming her displeasure with thunder and lightning. Hardly the grandest. The newlyweds spent three years in Council Bluffs, Iowa, where Harold learned the family business at McCormick Harvester. Years later, Edith would reflect on this time as perhaps the happiest in her life. She set about creating a household, ordering monogrammed handkerchiefs and linens, hiring staff and beginning her assemblage of priceless antiques. Finally allowed to spend money, she did so with gusto. Harold seemed to enjoy his work as salesman, putting his gregarious nature to good work. Their first son, John Rockefeller McCormick, was born in Iowa. Then they moved to Chicago, where a second son, Harold Fowler McCormick Jr., to be called Fowler, was born. They purchased a home on the north side of the city, which was dubbed McCormickville because so many of the relatives lived there, including Harold's mother, brother, and sister. The address was 1000 Lakeshore Drive. And in no time flat, Edith began to preside as Chicago's newest grand dame. The Bastion. That's what I called it, our house. It had a large ornamental gate all round. It felt secure, truly secure. I could walk out the world. Harold and I set out to have the grandest show home, a show place. We went to all the finest antique dealers, sent agents to the very best auctions. Now, the other mansions in Chicago had beautiful appointments, tapage paintings, linens, but the things I acquired had lineage. <laughs> Chief among them was the silver service that Napoleon gifted to his sister when she married the Prince Borghese. Sixteen hundred pieces oh, wow. <laughs> with the Borghese family crest. I made certain to use it for all the finest of the cabinets. I also had several of Napoleon's chairs with his initials. My bedroom, of course, was decorated in Louis the Sixteenth from my canopy bed and my enameled writing desk, and then some of my laces and linens dated back to the 15th century. And then, of course, there were the jewels. I had 18 of Catherine the Great's emeralds set with hundreds of diamonds, and then my pearls, my were later valued at two million perfectly matched. Then there were the earrings and the bracelets. 
Oh, it's, it's best to stop her there. <laughs> that could go on all day. In her defense, Edith's grand plan was to turn her house into a museum after her death. She was amassing these treasures, bringing them to this country so Chicago could have these showpieces. But in the meantime, she would enjoy them to the hills. Edith and Harold had a summer home built in Lake Forest. Dismissing designs from James Gamble Rogers and local Oak Park boy Frank Lloyd Wright, Edith, Edith wouldn't even glance at Wright's designs. They settled on Charles Adams Platt, who constructed an Italian villa overlooking the lake. Sadly, because of events about to unfurl, this summer home, which they called Villa Turricum, would never really be lived in. The money was flowing out. Jewels, antiques, portraits of both her and Harold, tapestries. Harold's passion was aviation. Here's one of his designs, the umbrella plane. There was another that he affectionately called the mustard plaster. And donations, so many donations. Edith and Harold were among a group of city leaders who spearheaded efforts to create a resident opera company in Chicago. Chicago needed opera. The true representation of a city is its culture. We cannot have a proper city without opera. Harold and I financed the opera. We supported it for many, many years. Of course, we were very nearly derailed in our first season. When soprano Mary Garden gave such a seductive representation of Salome, <laughs> that the police chief threatened to shut us down <laughs> as president of the opera. It would have come to Harold to speak to the diva, but I took it upon myself to tell her that my vibrations were all wrong and all the subsequent performances would be canceled. It was a busy time. By now, their house, the Bastion, was full. There was a bustling contingent of 17 servants working for the family. Cooks, sewing ladies, charwomen, footmen, chauffeurs, and nurses and governesses for the children. Edith and Harold had five children. Firstborn Jack and his brother Fowler were later joined by three girls, Muriel, Editha, and Matilde. But delighted though they were with these descendants and heirs, it was likely the children that caused Edith's life to take a sharp turn. In 1902, Jack suddenly died of scarlet fever. And just a few years later, baby Editha passed away before her first birthday. Jack changed us all. Harold called it his crushing sorrow. And he fled to Switzerland to undergo psychotherapy. For me, it brought back all of the fears and nervousness that I had harbored since childhood. Nothing was safe. I'd always been wary of the outside world, strangers, noise, commotion, but this time 
The fear came from inside, from our own family. All of my siblings suffered from nervous ailments. Harold's as well. His dear brother Stanley and his sister as well were both hospitalized. Poor Stanley with schizophrenia. This fear and nervousness was in our genes and in our children's. We could not escape it. Meanwhile, President McKinley was shot. Meanwhile, over 600 people died in a horrific fire at a Chicago theater. Meanwhile, McClure's Magazine published a scathing commentary on my father's work. Meanwhile, the Titanic sank. Nothing was safe. I began to have nervous attacks. Edith fled to Zurich to undergo psychoanalysis with a yet fairly unknown Carl Jung. What was intended to be a short stay of just a few months would grow into eight years. Oh, eight years of peaceful, quiet meditation. Eight years of no social pressures. Eight years of having her children raised by governesses or institutions and eight years of serious academic study, languages, history, philosophy. Edith thrived in Switzerland. In addition to becoming one of, one of Jung's greatest patrons, helping turn him into a household name, she also supported James Joyce, as he wrote Ulysses, and a number of talented young composers. And Jung, deciding that Edith was well-versed in his philosophies, anointed her as an analyst herself. She began taking patience and hearing hundreds of dreams each year. But meanwhile, the Great War raged on all sides of Switzerland. Meanwhile, Edith's mother died. Meanwhile, Edith's father fumed that she was abdicating all responsibility. And meanwhile, Harold strayed. Her name was Ghana. <laughs> Ghana Volska. And that was a stage name. She was an aspiring opera singer who showed up at the backstage door of the Chicago Opera. Hideous name. Hideous voice. That was the beginning of the end of our marriage. I did not want a divorce. I returned from Europe in an attempt to repair the relationship to no avail. Harold was adamant. He assembled a preeminent team of legal scholars, including Clarence Darrow. <laughs> Interesting that she didn't mention the gland transplant. Harold, concerned about his sagging libido, <laughs> underwent a controversial procedure that involved the injection of viral monkey glands. <laughs> he tried to keep it secret, but someone had tapped his phone lines and soon
soon his secret was out and it was front page news across the country. There's so much she didn't mention about this time period, like the fact that she brought back a young man from Zurich. <laughs> Edwin Prenn, a young Austrian friend who would remain at her side until her death. No one ever knew if they were lovers or just friends. And she didn't mention Mathilde either. That was probably too painful. Youngest daughter, Mathilde, raised primarily in a sanatorium in Davos, Switzerland because of lingering respiratory issues, fell in love with her riding instructor. Nearly 30 years her senior, she married him against Edith's strenuous wishes, and that was front page news as well. Edith's family cast her off. Her children, her siblings, her father, all disapproved of her years in Zurich, her spending, her beliefs, her relationship with Edwin. They rolled their eyes and they stepped away. I did what I could to elevate the culture of Chicago. A true representation of a people is its culture. Even after the divorce, I continued to support the opera, the community theater, the art institute, I founded the Brookfield Zoo, giving land that I own in Riverside to the Cook County Forest Preserve District. I also worked in real estate with my associate Edwin Friend and a friend of his. We formed the firm of Friend and Data. Our goal was to provide housing for the middle class. We began with one salesman who had be been a former taxi cab driver. <laughs> Within a couple of years, we had a large real estate firm. We sold over six thousand lots to people with over 26 million dollars in revenue. We even had plans for a utopian village near Kenosha, Wisconsin, Edithton. <laughs> Edith's father didn't approve. He warned her time and again to get out of the business. He never acknowledged any of her success, only providing a hearty, I told you so, when everything came crashing down. Edith's father and brother stood by and watched her financial collapse. She begged them for assistance time and again, only to hear, we regret it would not be in your best interest for us to provide this assistance. One must live an intentional life. No one else's opinion really matters. It is not for us to judge others, nor should we care of their opinions of us. Once my cancer diagnosis was known, people came around, 
my family, Harold, all of my relatives except father, who was by then too old, came to see me. My brother offered to support me with an allowance, providing I would give up my home and take up residence in a small suite in the Drake Hotel. I could see my home out of the window, my bastard. They came to visit me, Harold, my children, and there was a great reconciliation. <coughs> In the end, love is all that really matters. When we can see other people, we see ourselves, and in seeing ourselves, we see the world. Edith died in 1932 <coughs> at the age of 59 of breast cancer. On the day of her funeral, Thousands lined the streets to honor Chicago's patron saint. Her brother and family must have been stunned to see the affection for Edith, the acknowledgement of all that she had given to the city, opera, a zoo, community theater, real estate. An infectious diseases institute that she and Harold founded after their first son Jack's death helped curb scarlet fever. Once perhaps the nation's richest woman, Edith was bankrupt at the time of her death, having spent and given away her tremendous fortune. Her first will had stated that her home was to become the Rockefeller McCormick Museum of Chicago, which institution shall be a gallery of art a museum of antiquities and other rare and beautiful articles in order that it may aid in encouraging and developing the study of fine arts and of advancing the general knowledge of kindred subjects. However, her carefully collected belongings were auctioned off, sold for pennies on the dollar during the Depression. The museum was not to be. A true intellectual, a tremendous philanthropist, and a quirky, often prickly personality, Edith was a one of a kind. And all of us here in Chicago have benefited from her lasting gifts. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed learning a bit about this enigmatic woman. Edith and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, any questions for either Edith or Andrea? Could you describe your financing of Margaret Sanger's uh, birth control efforts? Oh. Hmm. So, so close. That was, remember Stanley McCormick, Harold's brother, who was institutionalized for the rest of his life. His wife was Catherine Dexter McCormick. And she was the one who, who financed Margaret Sanger, uh, the birth control pill, Planned Parenthood, all sorts of things like that. A truly remarkable woman. She went head to head with the McCormick family over Stanley's care. Um, she was, I, I believe, the second uh, female graduate of MIT and the first to graduate with a degree in biology. She pushed hard for endocrine testing for Stanley, but the doctors refused her for decades. 
I find it interesting too that Stanley was institutionalized in part because he had a very difficult time containing his physical urges. Whereas Harold underwent this surgery, uh, <laughs> injecting hormones. Um, so in one sense it was determined it was unrelated, in another sense it was determined this was perhaps your only hope. <laughs> So there's a movie coming out sometime soon about Catherine Dexter McCormick, and I can't wait because she's very deserving. Yes, thank you for that question. So what happened to 1000 Lakeshore Drive? Because I don't think it's there anymore. It is, it is not there anymore. There are now two tall condo buildings standing on that footprint. She, she doesn't know. Um, after her death, it stood empty for a long, long time. Nobody, at first the banks had to settle everything and then nobody could afford to buy it. So that was torn down in the 1950s. And her home in Lake Forest, Villa Turicum, suffered an even more brutal fate because it didn't have that protective gate all around it, the protective fencing. You could access it easily from the beach and it became a hangout spot for all those rough Lake Forest kids. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are pictures online of all of the graffiti and other things they did to deface that house. That was um, bought by a developer named Robert Kendler, who eventually tore it down and turned it into a subdivision. Thank you for the question. But Harold had a lot of Harold did have fun with it. Would you like to speak about his fun? Well, while I was busy studying and bettering myself, <laughs> Harold indulged in some activities at the home in Lake Forest. He was passionate about aeroplanes, and he would bring people to the home for weekend parties, which involved rides on his airplane. And um, it was quite scandalous. It was quite scandalous. They wore bathing suits with cork suits over them. Um, and Harold would follow along below in a little motorboat, just, you know, just in case. So, but it was often in the papers. It was kind of fun to read about. Yes, Edith would not have approved. I'm curious to know if Edith had any connection to McCormick Theological Seminary of Chicago. I'm a graduate of McCormick, and we always wondered about that name and why the Presbyterians chose to name their seminary McCormick. I understand that Cyrus was a trustee, but I don't know if Edith had any connection. Also, I, I heard you say the name Fowler. Is that Edith's? mother's name uh, or what the can anyway there was a, a women's dormitory at McCormick when it was on 2400 North Halstead and Fullerton on that intersection there was a women's dorm named Fowler Hall and we all thought that it was named that because of the phrase in the Psalms which warn about the snare of the Fowler <laughs> because <laughs> The women students usually ended up marrying the men students at the corner. I have to say, I love Q and A sessions. I think that's your next book. Oh, fantastic! Right there. Wow. Um, so let's see. The McCormick Theological Seminary um, is thanks to Nettie McCormick, who was uh, Harold's mother. <coughs> Uh, Cyrus McCormick was much, this is kind of a family trait, was much younger, uh, but Her Harold, sorry, Cyrus McCormick's wife, Nettie, was much younger than Cyrus was. So when Cyrus died, it fell to Nettie to hold the family together and to hold the business and the philanthropy together. She became a tremendous philanthropist. And back in the day, whenever you saw the name McCormick, it usually referred to Nettie McCormick. Um, and in fact, my daughter just traveled to Thailand and sent me a picture of the McCormick Hospital, which was just a few blocks from where she was staying, which I didn't even know about, that um, is named after Nettie because of all her, her philanthropic gifts. 
Nowadays, when you see the name McCormick, it usually refers to Robert McCormick, as in McCormick Place or the McCormick Foundation or out in, uh, is it Wheaton, um, Cantini's, Cantini's out there. Um, Edith's branch, shall we say, kind of petered out, and um, uh, Robert McCormick, his branch became much more well known. Um, and Fowler um, was Nettie's, it was a family name from Nettie's side of the family. I believe that was her, or was it her maiden name, I think, or maybe once removed, but that's where that comes from. And I've never heard that line before, so thank you for that. Love it. <laughs> that's a hard question to follow. Let's see who has the courage. Edith, your time with delving into psychology and your time becoming given the opportunity to do some therapy. Uh, how did you, did you work with anyone of renown? Did you bring that skill back to the States with you? And was Edward one of your disciples? So uh, if I, yes, I did bring that skill and training back with me. I, I did see many, many clients. If any of them were of renown, I would not be able to tell you. So please don't ask. <laughs> Certainly those are privileged records. And sadly, all of those records were also destroyed. When looking at the family archives, both the McCormick family archives and the Rockefeller archives, which are extensive, all the other families have box after box after box filled with many, many folders. Um, even the women, Benita McCormick, huge collection. Nettie McCormick, huge collection. Edith's collection, couple little boxes. So a lot of historians believe that her papers were destroyed after she died. I, I believe that to be true. I cannot prove that it is true. Yes. Yes, the, the theories are um, that her brother and her ex-husband destroyed those papers, um, in part because they might not look so good in there, in part because of the financial obligations that they implied towards Krenn and Dato, and it was better for the Rockefeller clan not to know anything about that. They wanted to wipe their hands of any responsibility. Had I been born a man, had I been born a man, my life would have been completely different. I'm far more intelligent than my brother. <laughs> not even a question. <laughs> Not even a question. And had I been a son rather than a daughter, my father's business would have fallen to me. But because I was a woman, nothing that I ever said or did was ever good enough for my father or my brother. And they did absolutely everything in their power to make absolutely certain that I would fail in any business endeavor that I ever entertained. And that was their goal. So the fact that records were destroyed is just another example of that situation. There are many letters from Edith to her father while she was in Switzerland saying things like, I sometimes wish that you forget you could forget that I am a woman. Or I would like to be involved with your philanthropies and so on. Yes, over here. Yes, uh, Edith. Did you have a hairdresser? And how did you come up with your hairdo? <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> I 
I'm the only woman currently alive that has this beard. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you will indulge me to uh, answer more of that question in five minutes, I would love to discuss it with you at a later point. But I feel that this hairstyle is very evocative of my past life. And as you know, as most of you know, uh, Jungian philosophy does embrace the concept of past lives. We have all been someone before. It remains to be seen if this is the best we can do. Some of us will get another chance, one hopes. And I am reincarnated from Akhenaten, who was one of King Tut's child brides. And because of that, having a hairstyle that evokes an Egyptian presence is something that I It never caught on. <laughs> there is only one Akhenaz <laughs> um, Edith, could you please share with us your um, involvement with the suffragist movement and women securing uh, what had been denied to them since uh, the Constitution was uh, adopted, which is the right to vote. Thank you. That is a very, very good question. And I will tell you, like many women of my generation, I began life, of course, my upbringing being duty, honor, piety. I began life thinking that a woman's role was to be a wife and a helpmate to her husband and a mother to her children. I certainly believed that as a young woman. I even published articles about that. As I grew older, as many of you silver-haired ladies in the audience will attest, once one has raised one's children, one realizes that there were a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes that we weren't aware of because we were so busy raising children. And so it is the middle-aged and older-aged woman who really has the responsibility because she is no longer tied with her apron she has the responsibility to bring forth women's rights. But I did not come to that realization until I was done raising my family and became, unfortunately in my case, a divorcee, which does happen to many of us. And once I no longer had a husband and children to take care of, I had the time to think about the woman movement and women's issues. And I think that if we, as a people, can encourage young women, young mothers, young married women, young single women, to actually look at the trajectory of women's lives and see how just because we were born female doesn't mean that we can't be successful in business, or we can't be successful in philanthropy, or we can't be successful in arts. That is what our job as older women really is. And that is what I would like to impart to this audience, although I fear there are very few younger people. <laughs> so go for it, you people. And, and tell this to the young women in your lives, because it's very important. Yeah. 
I will, I will just add very briefly to that, um, that Edith was not at the forefront of the women's movement here in the United States. Catherine Dexter McCormick, who we spoke about earlier, was. Lots of pictures of her proudly carrying the banner and such. Um, but something that really interested me in Edith's story was her evolution as a woman and how it wasn't until later in life that she really fully came into her own. And I found that it made me look at my own evolution as a woman and study that a little bit more closely. So if you read the book, I hope that that theme comes through and uh, that uh, for the women in the audience that you spend some time thinking about how have I evolved during the course of my lifetime? So thank you for the excellent question. Yes, uh, we had a senator named Charles Percy who had two daughters, one of whom named John, Mary John D. Rockefeller IV. I believe he's still alive. Was he Edith's grandson? And is he still alive? And is there a John D. Rockefeller V or any other residents living in Illinois? So anybody with a Rockefeller surname descends from Edith's brother, Junior. He was the only son in the family, and all of the Rockefellers now come from him. He had a lot of kids. <laughs> there are a lot of Rockefellers, uh, including Nelson Rockefeller, who's a familiar name uh, because of uh, vice president and then presidential run and so on. Um, they have a strong civic service Bent. Um, so you will find them in, in many positions uh, that, are, that are oriented that way. Um, and as far as the Chicago connection, um, there, there is a descendant of Edith's sister, Alta, who lives in Chicago. Uh, Alta married Parmalee Prentice, if you're familiar with the last name Prentice, um, and, and that family uh, continues on as well. So, thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, was Harold related to Robert McCormick from the Tribune, and how were they related? Yes. Um, so Harold's father, Cyrus, his brother was Robert's grandfather. So technically, Harold was Robert's uncle. Um, but they were only a few years apart because of the whole age disparity thing with Cyrus. Uh, so they really behaved as, as cousins. Um, and the only correspondence I found between the two was when the Tribune was writing articles about the gland transplant. <laughs> and uh, Harold sent him a telegram and said, stop or there will be lawsuits. <laughs> so they didn't stop and there weren't any lawsuits. Robert I, I have a question. Um, how did this unique, gifted, and wealthy personality fit into the Chicago social scene with the Bertha Palmers and all of all of folks like that? Yes. Yes, so Bertha Palmer um, was, was just kind of on her way out as Edith was coming in, so the timing was perfect. Um, and uh, yes, Edith... Uh, Early in her marriage, before she went to Zurich, um, Edith and Harold entertained heavily, and uh, that was that was the invite you wanted, right? It was a, a, a ticket to the to the uh, Rockefeller McCormick mansion. Um, when Edith came back from Switzerland and got her divorce, uh, her entertaining was much more toned down, um, and she usually only only gave big. Parties when there was royalty in town, so and then she could she could break out the the uh, Borghese silverware. Uh, Edith, what happened to your children? Uh, that's that's an answer. Yes, I'm sorry, Edith doesn't know what happened to her children. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so Fowler, um, the oldest child at that point. Um, he went on to, of course, a career in international harvester. And I'm sorry, I, wasn't, I didn't see where the question came from. I usually try to end. There, thank you. Okay. Um, he went on to a career in international harvester. Um, and he, uh, oh, 
Shortly after college, um, there was a rumor that he was involved with um, one of the Stillman daughters. Uh, the, the James and Fifi Stillman were in the newspapers all the time. They were undergoing a terribly scandalous divorce. And there's a letter from Father um, to Fowler saying, I hear rumors that you are involved with Ann Stillman. Please say this isn't true. Um, you know, we, we cannot afford to be involved with a family like, with such scandal. And Fowler honestly wrote back and said, I, I'm not involved with Ann. Uh, he was involved with Fifi, the mother. Uh, <laughs> Fifi was the mother of Fowler's college roommate. And they lived nearby as well. So, uh, so uh, Harold, uh, Fowler became a step friend uh, to the Stillman family. Um, and later on, excellent grandfather, uncle, and so on, very much a family man. So the marriage lasted. He was a well-adjusted, I think, pretty happy individual. Uh, Matilde, who had married her riding instructor, Max Ozer, uh, they had two children, um, thankfully, um, Max and Anita, or no, sorry, Peter and Anita. Uh, Peter didn't have any children. Uh, Anita married Linus Pauling, Jr., Linus Pauling being the double Nobel Prize winner. Um, so they had a number of children. That family is going strong. They have been very supportive of this project. They are lovely, interesting, diverse people. Um, and then Muriel, who had struggled with really severe emotional issues all her life. Um, she married shortly before Edith died. Uh, she married a man, uh, you'll be shocked, a couple of uh, decades older than herself, um, Alicia Dyer Hubbard. Uh, they were they did not have children. I believe that was actually due to Muriel being unable to for a much longer, really interesting story that um, <laughs> that uh, is detailed in the book. But um, after Alicia died, Muriel adopted two different sets of children at two different times in her life. Um, she was an unfit mother and Fowler intervened in the courts to get those children removed. Muriel was an alcoholic and uh, just emotionally not fit to be a mother. Thank you. Mrs. McCormick, I have a question about your uh, real estate developments. There was a, a uh, development on Michigan Avenue, and I believe it was called the Italian Courts, and it was something that you were involved with, uh, as I recall, I'm just wondering if you could ex you know, tell me a little bit more about the conception behind that development. My only real estate dealings would have been under the auspices of credit data. And so that does not sound familiar, although there are uh, some places in the Chicago area with either Cren or Dado or both of those uh, as street names. But on Michigan Avenue, I do, do you know? So I am unfamiliar with that. I believe it, it was. I believe it was a development like in the mid 20s. And it consisted of a court of small shops. And, you know, I'm trying to recollect what I'm what uh, I read about. So it's entirely possible that she was involved with that. The list of of homes and apartment buildings and complexes that they that they built is very long, and I I cannot say categorically that that one was not on the list. Um, there are maps of the various areas that they developed. Most of them were a little bit further out of town. Uh, they bought up a lot of line along the, the brand new L tracks, brought, bought up a lot of land along the brand new L tracks, including uh, the end of what is now the Skokie Swift. So there was a large apartment complex out there. Um, and uh, a lot of places just north of the city um, also some out of town in Iowa City and other places. So as I say, I'm not familiar with that one, but it is it is entirely possible. Somebody contacted me recently and said they live in an 
at Crennan Dado building that I had no, no idea of. I so. would think if it was at Michigan and Ontario, that would be part of the Cormac bill. Because there were a lot of memorials that were built at the Cormac bill that were not built in the But there were two questions about the zoo. The first one was, why a zoo at all? And the second one is a little more detailed. Um, this person is wondering, uh, saying that they didn't realize that Edith passed away before the grand opening of the Brookfield Zoo. Um, did, Edith, did you get to see the compound um, while it was under construction? And if so, what did you think of the results? I did not get to see the finished zoo, sadly. I, I did get to see some models uh, that were plants in the works. And why a zoo is because animals are interesting. <laughs> and, and children and families need to be able to study animals so that they have a better idea of what the entire world is like. The entire world is not just your neighborhood of people. The entire world includes animals. And I believe that animals are very people. And so that's why the zoo. And no, sadly, I did not live long enough to see the zoo's completion. So Edith gave the land for the zoo in 1919, which was shortly before returning to Chicago. And there are many who believe <clears throat> that she gave the land because of the back taxes that she owed. Her, her public statement was that we must study animals in order to better understand the human soul, which really sounds like her, I gotta say. The zoo opened in 1934. Edith had died in 1932. And I could not find any evidence that she had ever stepped foot on the property. Travel was very, very difficult for her, even within the Chicago land area. So it, it's very unlikely that she would have come out there, although Harold did. Harold came out to inspect the land early on. So, and thank you, Zoom people, for being here. I meant to welcome you at the beginning, and I totally forgot. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to take just one more question, and then we're going to adjourn downstairs for tea. And if everyone will proceed down there, they will be able to ask some more questions. Uh, so one last question. Uh, not a question per se, but it is. I live on the block in Riverside that was your property, Maplewood Road along the river. So I'm wondering, did Edith, I, we understand that she never lived there. Is that true? And that it was given to her by her father as a gift? Okay. Yes, that is all true. Yes. And uh, I used to have a good friend living on that block. So I know, I know just, just where that street is. It's a lovely place to be. Yes. So all of the, um, hi, I'm Ellie. <laughs> downstairs. Our two presenters will come on downstairs. There are also books for sale down there. Yes, the award-winning books are for sale downstairs, so we will be down and she will be happy to sign them. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.